Thank you all and welcome back to our final session. We are now uh, in session seven, genomic surveillance for malaria elimination and barriers to translation. Uh, it's going to be an exciting uh, session. We have three famous speakers lined for us today and we'll listen to uh, from Sophonia Stesema, who is the program lead at the Pathogen Genomic Institute of Africa, CDC. And then we will go ahead and listen to Jennifer Gardy, the Deputy Director of Surveillance Data and Epidemiology at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And lastly, we'll have Dominic Kiakoski, Head of Parasite and Microbe Sequencing at the Welcome uh, Sanger Institute and Oxford University. Uh, Sophonias will talk about Africa Pathogen Genomics Ini Initiative, Africa Pathogen Genomics uh, Beyond COVID-19. And Jenny will talk about advancing genomics for malaria elimination. What can we learn from COVID-19? And Dominic will talk about putting genomic epidemiology into practice for malaria and COVID-19. And thereafter, we'll have an exciting panel discussion where the three speakers will uh, share with us some insights about the topics and many other uh, star, other interesting things uh, in this area. So uh, we'll now go ahead and listen from our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Today, my talk will focus on the Africa Pathogen Genomics uh, Initiative and uh, what can be done uh, beyond COVID-19. My name is uh, Sophonias Tasama. I work at the Africa CDC Institute of Pathogen Genomics as a program lead for uh, pathogen genomics activities. All right, to start with today's presentation, I will uh, give a very brief uh, background uh, how public health pathogen genomics activities started at the Africa CDC. Uh, since uh, 2018, uh, Africa CDC has been conducting assessment of genomics and bioinformatics capacity uh, across the continent uh, with support from the malaria group at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, this uh, team has actually visited 22 institutions in 11 countries and conducted an on-site assessment and then also uh, we conducted additional virtual assessments and collected data from different uh, service providers. Uh, the report from this assessment is uh, summarized in a publication, uh, which was published uh, uh, recently in uh, February. Since the assessment uh, uh, preliminary report was generated, the Africa CDC responded by launching uh, the Institute of Pathogen Genomics to address the continental need in expanding pathogen genomics and bioinformatics capacity. Uh, however, after two months of launching of this institute, the COVID-19 outbreak uh, has emerged uh, and our focus has been you know, responding to the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, uh, we've been advocating for increased and accelerated genomic-based surveillance across the continent uh, before uh, any of these variants were reported. So to summarize a little bit of the findings from this uh, assessment, uh, uh, what we found is more than 80% of NGS capacity in Africa is not in public health institution. Uh, and as you can see on the map, uh, the size of the, the, the bubbles shows the number of NGS equipments. Uh, there are countries that do not have any uh, NGS equipment. So showing that uh, capacity is not uh, distributed uniformly across the continent. In addition to capacity gaps, we also observed that there is a no continental policy or guideline uh, to support genomics. There is inadequate technical workforce, very uh, severe uh, uh, workforce shortage, as well as uh, limited translation of uh, pathogen genomics into public health decision making. So the Africa CDC Institute of Pathogen Genomics is launched to support the integration of pathogen genomics and bioinformatics into public health surveillance, outbreak investigation, and improve disease control and prevention in Africa. Uh, and we are currently addressing uh, or operating uh, with five cross-cutting strategic priorities, uh, which all of them are, uh, are designed based on you know, the assessment report. So enabling mechanisms, policies, and guidelines are needed. Uh, establishing a continental pathogen genomics and bioinformatics network, 
addressing the capacity gaps, addressing the data issues, as well as uh, conducting or supporting the implementation of public health priority use cases. Our support for uh, COVID-19 uh, has actually grew into a bigger uh, initiative, uh, what we call the Africa Pathogen Genomics Initiative. Uh, this Africa Pathogen Genomics Initiative was launched in partnership with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, Illumina, CTC, Microsoft, Oxford Nanopore, as well as others. Uh, this initiative uh, is uh, bringing the public, the private, and the philanthropic um, uh, sectors together to support the implementation of pathogen genomics in Africa. The initiative has five components. The first one is strengthening the Africa CDC Institute of Pathogen Genomics. As I said, uh, we have a, a gap in terms of continental policies and guidance. So uh, leadership, coordination, and resource mobilization is needed at, at a continental level. Creating enabling mechanisms and policies uh, are also needed. So the Africa CDC Institute of Pathogen Genomics is tasked to develop that. Coordinating and creating a continental network, African Pathogen Genomics and Bioinformatics Network, as well as strengthening the capacity of the network. As you saw on the map, there is a, a, a non-uniform distribution of capacity. So how do we leverage the existing capacity to support pathogen genomics in Africa? The third gap is the data gap, and uh, Africa PGR has also prioritized uh, the data architecture and systems uh, to address the data analysis, interpretation, utilization, sharing, archiving, and storage, uh, all of those issues that are related to uh, data. The fourth is NGS Academy, uh, which uh, will address the workforce development in genomics, bioinformatics, uh, as well as uh, uh, basic genomic epidemiology across the continent. The fifth is implementation of high impact genomic use cases. So uh, to just give you a little bit of uh, background, since uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, the Africa PGA has been focusing on supporting uh, acceleration of SARS-CoV-2 uh, sequencing in Africa. Africa CTC jointly with the WHO Afro uh, created a, a continental sequencing network uh, to respond to the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, as well as other emerging pathogens. This network has three layers. The top one is the specialized genomics and bioinformatics centers. Uh, the second layer is the regional COVID-19 sequencing laboratories, and the third is national level sequencing laboratories. So all of these are generating sequences at different levels, uh, but ideally the specialized genomics and bioinformatics centers will provide support for the regional and the national lab, and the regional labs are uh, expected to provide support for the national level labs. So since uh, 2021, after the report of variants, we've been focusing on operationalization of this network, coordination, as well as leveraging the existing capacities uh, to provide access to sequencing for our member states, as well as promoting data sharing from uh, member states. So what, what is in our acceleration plan? Our acceleration plan uh, plans to start simple and establish a routine surveillance, leverage on the existing capacity in the, in the continent, support capacity building, training, reagents, equipment upgrades, as well as automation, uh, support sample referral process, uh, MTA, material transfer agreements, making sure that permits and logistics are available, uh, and uh, support data analysis, sharing, and reporting. So our operation uh, plan is actually uh, uh, often uh, focused on this, uh, closing the loop between member states where the sampling is done and the regional hub where the sequencing is um, uh, conducted. So from member states, we are addressing the challenge that are related to sample referral process, standardization of metadata, making sure that import permits and material transfer agreements are in place, uh, and making sure that courier services are in place as well. Once the samples reach to the regional hub, uh, then at the regional hub level, we have tasks that are related to supporting the regional hub when it comes to personnel and training, regions and supplies, quality control, equipment upgrade and automation. Once the data is generated, making sure that the data is uh, reported back to the countries uh, in a very standardized manner, as well as you know, making sure that the turnaround time is reasonable uh, for sending uh, the data in a timely manner to the countries. So the Africa uh, PGI has been supporting this regional uh, hubs and specialized centers. Uh, one uh, by subawarding to these uh, laboratories to support personnel and address the um, immediate needs. The second one is together with uh, the private sector, Illumina and Oxford Nanopore Technology. Uh, we've been uh, also supporting uh, sequencing with sequencing reagents. Uh, 
Uh, and we are also in discussion to upgrade equipments uh, as well as uh, conducting trainings. So where are we now? If we look at the sample referral uh, process, since uh, February 2021, more than 10,000 samples from 30 countries were referred to eight regional hubs. As you can see on the graph here, the number of samples that are being referred is, uh, is, is increasing over time. So how does that translate into uh, sequencing output? This is based on the number of sequences that are shared to us or to uh, GIS-8. Uh, as you can see, nearly 15,000 genomes have been generated in the last two years, uh, but almost 10,000 of these sequences are generated in uh, 2021, in the last five months. These sequences are originating from 42 countries, and majority or about 80% of uh, these sequences are coming from the labs that are supported by Africa PGI. Uh, further details on the sequencing can be uh, found uh, on our dashboard. Uh, our dashboard uh, reports the number of sequences as well as which countries and which member states are reporting what type of uh, variants of uh, concern uh, and how many sequences are found to have that specific variant. Uh, despite the progress, we have several challenges that are remaining to be addressed. The first one is uh, limited sequencing capacity in the continent and uh, limited throughput. Uh, there's in the whole of Africa, there's only one lab that has a NovaSeq um, uh, capability. Uh, other than that, there is no uh, NovaSeq capability. There are very few uh, regional hubs that have at least Nexic level equipment. So there's limited throughput and there's limited automation across, across, across the continent, even at the specialized centers and at their regional hubs. Uh, there is challenge that's related to uh, material transfer agreements, import and export permits, uh, logistic and custom challenge when we are trying to move samples from one country to the other or reagents from the donors to the labs. There are challenges that are related to logistics and customs. Uh, lack of standardized data analysis, sharing and reporting frameworks or platforms. We don't have that uh, at the continental level. Uh, that has been also a challenge. Uh, the whole focus of the Africa PGI at the moment is how do we improve the efficiency of the sample referral network uh, and improve uh, the generation of routine data uh, to inform uh, the outbreak response for COVID-19. But what are the lessons that we learn uh, from this COVID-19 sequencing in Africa? And how do we translate and use this uh, for uh, malaria or other diseases? I think the first lesson is there is limited sequencing and bioinformatics capacity. I think strengthening this capacity across the continent is, is urgently needed. The second one is what we approached, our approach was to leverage the existing capacity in the continent, whether it's built for HIV or malaria, we were able to use it for uh, COVID-19. I think uh, uh, the leveraging existing, existing capacity to support multi-pathogen sequencing is, is, is highly needed. So any capacity that you are uh, building for malaria, it could be also used for other pathogens. The need uh, for improved engagement with the private sector is another lesson that we've learned. Uh, uh, I, I think improved engagement, uh, continued engagement with the private sector will help to improve uh, and address some of the challenges that I mentioned particularly challenges that are related to the logistics, as well as challenges that are related to access to reagents and also technical support. Logistical challenges uh, and the remaining gaps, now we, uh, we know what kind of logistical challenges we face when we move sample from one part to the other, as well as when we move reagents from, uh, from the uh, companies to the regional hubs. So uh, understanding the, log the logistical challenges could really help in terms of addressing them. Uh, and we are working to address some of the remaining gaps. There's lack of uh, uh, standardized data sharing practice policies and platforms. So this uh, is uh, something that is needed not only just for COVID, but it is needed for, uh, for all pathogens, including malaria. So improving and standardizing uh, the data sharing practices, policies, and platforms is one of the remaining gaps. The last one is, uh, and the most important one, is COVID-19 pandemic had created I'm quoting a DNA revolution. Um, uh, this DNA revolution actually helped us build the overall genomic knowledge across uh, the continent, whether the Ministry of Health, the National Public Health Institutes are currently active in establishing uh, genomics capacity or in utilizing the existing genomics capacity. So we all need to leverage on this uh, DNA revolution and uh, uh, use it as an opportunity to strengthen uh, overall pathogen sequencing 
malaria sequencing, HIV, or other pathogen sequencing in the continent. And this is a great opportunity to expand genomics and bioinformatics capacity across, across Africa. There are remaining challenges, but this challenge has been uh, addressed and will continue to address together as a team. Uh, and I think uh, the lessons that the overall lesson that we are learning from COVID uh, is uh, it will uh, pave the way for uh, other pathogens. So the Africa PGI is currently working to prioritize other use cases. And one of the use cases will definitely be malaria. So we'll, 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 we are very excited to continue and work on this space and then also uh, get the lessons uh, from other pathogens like uh, malaria. So with that, I will uh, acknowledge uh, the supporters of the Africa uh, PGI and all the data, uh, all the labs that are working closely uh, with the uh, Africa Pathogen Genomics uh, Institute. So uh, we are supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're supported by Illumina, uh, Oxford Nanoport Technologies, US CTC, Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, uh, Fogarty in one or another way. Uh, there's a lot of partners you can see here, regional, local, as well as international partners that made this uh, initiative a reality. Uh, we'll continue to expand uh, the activities of this initiative in the coming year. Uh, and expand the activities of this initiative beyond uh, COVID-19. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. I'm happy to take any questions. Over to you. Hi, everyone. It is a true pleasure to be here with you all today. And while it would have been wonderful to have had the chance to meet in person, I am so pleased that through this virtual format, we are able to welcome participants from around the world. Really, the nexus of capacity and momentum when it comes to using genetics and genomics for malaria control and elimination is shifting. Every year, we are seeing more and more support, superb work coming out of malaria and countries, places like Sub-Saharan Africa, the greater Mekong subregion. So the fact that we're having a free and virtual meeting that is accessible to scientists working all around those world and in those malaria endemic places is so, so important. Uh, before I begin with my remarks, since this is technically my first GEM meeting, I wanted to briefly introduce myself so you know the perspective that I'm bringing to these remarks today. Uh, I have been with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for two and a half years uh, now, and there I lead our surveillance data and epidemiology portfolio, uh, working alongside our two senior program officers, uh, John Cox and SD Tora. The goal of our little corner of the foundation's overall malaria team is pretty simple. We want to empower national malaria control programs to be able to make better decisions based on high quality, timely data. And whether that is crafting a new national strategic plan, whether it's developing a global fund application, or whether it's understanding whether the current crop of interventions that they're deploying is working, we really want NMCPs to be using data to inform how their program is run. That means we invest in things like improving routine surveillance systems and deploying new digital tools. It means that we support a number of geospatial and mathematical modelers to test out uh, the potential impact of various combinations of interventions. And it means that we invest in new data streams that can provide actionable intelligence on a faster and a more accessible basis than things like an every few years parasite prevalence survey or an every every two years treatment efficacy study. And one of those data streams that we're really helping to move uh, from research into proof of concept um, and routine, or sorry, move from research and proof of concept into a more routine operational usage within an NMCP, uh, that data stream is parasite and vector genomic data. And my own background before joining the foundation was actually in pathogen genomic epidemiology. Uh, in fact, I was just thinking now, uh, this time, this exact time last month, I was here in this same virtual meeting hall uh, running the bacterial and viral equivalent of JAM, uh, the Applied Bioinformatics and Public Health Microbiology Conference. Uh, so pathogen genomics is where I come from. I did spend a decade working at the interface of academia and public health uh, really helping to roll out some of the first use cases for public health genomics. 
So while I may be a new face to some of you in this malaria genomic epidemiology community, uh, I do have a long track record working in pathogen genomics as a whole. And what I want to share with you today are some reflections on what we've learned both in the past decade of scaling up pathogen genomics in settings around the world uh, for routine usage, uh, and a little bit about um, what we've learned from using genomics in the context of the COVID pandemic. I think both of these experiences hold a lot of lessons that are very applicable to what we do as we scale up malaria genomic epidemiology in endemic country settings. Uh, and there's three particular lessons that I wanted to specifically call out today uh, ahead of the panel discussion. So the first point that I want to make is the need for integration. We simply cannot scale genomic epidemiology for malaria alone. If we really want genomic surveillance to be embedded within a national public health program, within an NMCP, we really need to work across disease verticals if we're going to ensure a sustainable future. From past experience, we've seen time and time again that when you put a sequencer in a lab and you say, you know, this is the TB sequencer or this is the foodborne pathogen sequencer, what often happens is that siloed sequencer ends up becoming a very expensive paperweight. Uh, it's not used enough by a single group. Uh, it's only funded with research and not operational money. You get personnel turnover within the group and you end up with nobody that knows how to run the thing. And this is something that we really need to be proactive about preventing when it comes to the sequencing capacity that's being stood up for SARS-CoV-2 genomics right now. If we don't have a trend transition plan in place, if we don't have post-pandemic use cases for these machines, honestly, you know, in a year or so from now, we're going to be able to really just open an expensive paperweight museum. So what you need is a cohort of trained lab technologists who can take extracted DNA from any source, run it on a sequencer that's being used multiple times every week or every month, um, and text that can do all that basic upstream QC bioinformatics work, like making sure the run actually worked. You basically need a small pathogen genomics core facility that can handle malaria, TB, HIV, viral samples, you name it. The sampling platforms are going to vary from disease to disease uh, to disease, as will the downstream bioinformatics analysis and interpretation steps. But really, if you want to achieve the economies of scale that make sequencing feasible, and if you want to retain a skilled workforce, you really have to think beyond a single pathogen and have a machine that is serving a range of use cases. We were actually uh, on site at the Welcome Genome Campus. Uh, at this point, I'm probably wave my hands around and say that one of the reasons that the UK's COVID genomics effort, COG UK, has been so successful is because a core facility with a cross pathogen mandate, like the Sanger Center um, or like the Public Health England genomics team at Collendale, those things existed. Those core facilities existed and could be quickly leveraged for SARS CoV 2 work. And I can tell you that the, the converse has also been true. Many public health units in North America who had been doing some sequencing for a very specific pathogen, they struggled with the pivot to COVID genomics. And I should underscore, uh, I'm not talking about academic research uh, groups here, but rather, you know, a city or a state or a provincial um, laboratory. These were public health units that treated genomics for the most part as something that fell in the domain of research rather than surveillance. So any genomics work that they were doing tended to be highly project specific. Lab techs would be reassigned to other work once the sequencing project had finished. All of that really made standing up a rapid genomics response much harder in these sorts of groups. You know, genomics had been done in a silo. So essentially these groups were starting from scratch when it came to their COVID work. And when you have to start fresh, when you have to train new people, order new reagents, work through data management and data sharing issues with every new project, it makes sustainability really, really challenging. So I think the malaria community, as we look towards a future where labs like the nodes in Africa CDC's Pathogen Genomics Institute are routinely working on malaria sequencing, that needs to be a future where that malaria work is being done alongside genomic epidemiology of a range of other pathogens as well. I think that really is the key to unlocking efficiencies in the system. 
The next uh, takeaway that I want to leave you with is the need for us to work on the upstream and the downstream challenges when it comes to malaria genomic epidemiology. I often liken genomic epi to a bow tie. Uh, the sequencing itself is the knot in the middle because it's really tight and it's tidy. We've figured that part out for the most part. The ends of the bow tie though, the floppy bits that are sometimes like completely sideways depending on how good you are at tying a tie, those are the upstream challenges like figuring out sampling frameworks and solving issues with equipment and consumables procurement. And then those are the downstream challenges like common approaches to analytics and issues around data and information sharing. And it's time that we really get the, the ends of the bow tie sorted out and to get our ties tied properly. I think, you know, these are both very big issues, uh, very big domains, the upstream and the downstream, but I think upstream, the most pressing issue that we need to be looking at is ensuring that scientists in LMICs have equitable access to equipment and reagents. That means paying the same price or better yet a subsidized price as compared to other buyers. It means not having supplies held up at a customs warehouse where they might spoil or be subjected to excess duties and tariffs. It means being able to have a service technician come visit their lab site and make any necessary repairs on a timely basis. And this is an area that the global health community is certainly working hard on and which COVID has really accelerated, um, but we do have to protect the gains we've made and we do have to go a lot farther. Part of this, I think, involves working directly with sequencing companies and with reagent suppliers and really being dogged about it. Uh, I can tell you that for many years, a lot of companies just, just simply didn't see markets like Africa as priorities. And we are starting to see that change. But we as a community really can't let up pressure. And I'm sure that many of you who work in academic units in places like North America or the UK or Europe might be wondering what you can do versus what an entity like Africa CDC or the Gates Foundation can do. But the answer is really simple. Um, make sure that the company reps you work with know that this is a problem. Advocate for better market access for your LMIC friends and collaborators and invite LMIC scientists to speak at the conferences the meetings that these companies are attending so that they can see for themselves the really, really good work that's happening there. On the larger global architecture um, stage, this is certainly an area of tremendous interest for us at the foundation, for the Global Fund, uh, for USAID and its constituent entities, um, and for groups like Africa CDC and the African Union. There are a lot of moving parts here in domains from advocacy to market access, um, but it is something that people in this field are committed to improving. And it's something that really does go beyond malaria to include a range of other disease communities. On uh, the other end of the bow tie, that was the most pressing upstream challenge. I think one of the most pressing downstream challenges um, is around bioinformatics and data sharing. And this is one that I really think is going to unfold differently in different pathogen areas. So here, uh, malaria really is going to have to chart its own course. I think that the past and the recent history of pathogen genomics um, show us just how much variation there can be within this space, uh, depending on the nature of the disease in question. So uh, for an example of where open data sharing, open analysis is very much the norm, I think um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration's Genome Tracker Project provides a really, really nice instructive example. Uh, Genome Tracker collates bacterial genomic data um, and very, very detailed sample metadata for a number of food and waterborne pathogens. And what you see are public health agencies from around the world the US, Canada, the UK, Europe, they are contributing their data in real time and they typically both make um, raw FASTQ files and assembled consensus sequences available. And if you stop to think, you know, why is there so much buy-in to this particular project? Uh, I personally think that it boils down to a few things. 
First is that uh, foodborne outbreaks frequently cross jurisdictional boundaries. You can have a food item being recalled in nearly every American state and Canadian province. And there's plenty of examples of outbreaks spanning the UK and Europe from salmonella to E. coli. It's not like a respiratory pathogen like flu or uh, like SARS-CoV-2 where you can you know, lock your country down, close the borders and stay safe. These outbreaks always span multiple regions so that international data sharing is vitally important for tracking and solving these outbreaks. And I would argue that, you know, like foodborne illness, the same importance of international data sharing is true for malaria. Uh, whether you're a country who shares borders with other endemic countries and sees a lot of population mobility, or whether you are a near elimination setting, uh, trying to understand whether your handful of cases are local or imported, being able to see the data from other settings provides really, really critical context. I think the second region or reason that something like genome trackers had a lot of buy-in is that there's a long history of formal data sharing networks in that space. Before whole genome sequencing came along, uh, the foodborne microbiology community was using pulse field gel electrophoresis. They were routinely sharing patterns through the PulseNet network. So routinely sharing whole genome sequencing data wasn't really a big stretch for them. And again, I think this is an area where malaria is well positioned for success. Malaria Gen, for instance, has set a superb precedent for sharing um, both Plasmodium and Anopheles genetic and genomic data of various types. Uh, and as a lot of work establishing data ownership and data sharing agreements that I think can be adapted by other groups outside the network. I think one of the third reasons, um, and perhaps this is the, the most critical, um, why genome tracker and foodborne data sharing has been a success, but we haven't seen that play out in something like uh, influenza or SARS-CoV-2, it's that when it comes to food and waterborne diseases, these are areas that are just not fraught with IP issues. They're a domain where because there are no real treatments or vaccines, there isn't inequity in terms of the people that are generating the data not being the ones who then benefit from the therapeutics that are derived from that data. This is a huge injustice in the COVID-19 space, and it's been an issue with respiratory viruses going back to highly pathogenic avian influenza in the 1990s, but it's not something that's really affected the foodborne space. We haven't seen it play out in other diseases like TB, which I worked in for many years, and where again, there's fairly um, friction-free sharing of genomic data. So in malaria, I have to say, I honestly don't know how this is gonna pan out. Uh, I think the dawn of the mRNA vaccine era is gonna draw a lot of attention to the potential for deriving IP from shared genomic data. Uh, I, I think it would really be great for us as a malaria genomics community to be proactive in setting out the principles that should guide data sharing in this space. And I think there's a huge role for organizations um, like what used to be Plasmodium Diversity Network Africa and is now PGDNA, I think there's a huge role for groups like that to play in setting those norms. I'm going to end with the third takeaway, and I will be brief here because it's very simple. The most successful public health genomics efforts involve teams that span different domains. In any given setting, whether it's elimination or high burden, we need to ensure engagement across the board from academia to government, and we need to work across areas from surveillance to functional genomics if we're going to have a really cohesive and effective malaria genomic epidemiology problem. Uh, program, sorry, not a problem. We don't want a problem. Um, I'll give you two examples from COVID genomics where uh, sort of taking this cross-sector, cross-domain approach has worked really well. Um, the first, I might get some eye rolls for this one, but hear me out. Um, the first is the recent genomic surveillance work in the U.S. And certainly the U.S. does lag behind other places when it comes to COVID genomics, um, especially early in the pandemic. But more recently, we've ended up in a really interesting place where sequences were coming from the usual state public health labs, but they were also coming from academic groups, from hospital systems, and even from industry partners. And the system certainly wasn't without its challenges, especially around information sharing. But I do think there is something perhaps to this hybrid intersectoral networked approach to genomic surveillance that might be worth exploring for other pathogens. Uh, and the second example I wanted to quote was the superb work that's being done in South Africa to not just track uh, emerging SARS-CoV-2 variants, but to really understand the implications of those variants. Uh, the genomic surveillance team there works very closely with functional genomics and with immunology groups who can really explore how these variants differ 
differ from wild type viruses. And they're also very closely tied to groups leading vaccine trials. So they can look at the uh, impact of variants on vaccine efficacy. And it's, I think, a really nice example of an interdisciplinary team being able to offer a really holistic and complete view of what is an ever-changing infectious disease scenario. Uh, I shall end there so we can keep plenty of time for the panel discussion. Uh, and there, I would love to hear your questions and your thoughts on what we could do best when it comes to operationalizing malaria genomic epidemiology. I know that part of this session title is Barriers to Translation, so I would love to hear what you think the biggest barriers are and uh, what you have in terms of bright ideas for solving those. Uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, giving these remarks. And I really, really do look forward to the panel discussion. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Mara, Caroline, Deus, Dan, and Vicky for organizing a fantastic program of talks for GEM 2021, and for, for inviting Soph and I, Jen and me, to discuss some lessons that have been learned from the, uh, from the pandemic. Um, the last time Jen and I were in the same room was, was back in February 2020, which seems like a long time ago now, uh, uh, the launch of a, of, a, of a new malarian initiative funded by the Gates Foundation, whose, whose goal is to enable malaria control programs and policy makers to use genetic data, integrate it with epidemiological data, and make more informed decisions about how to deploy next generation bed nets, how to coordinate the rotation of multiple insecticides used for IRS, how to maintain sustainable and effective uh, antimalarial drug treat treatments, particularly in Southeast Asia, and how to target malaria control interventions for, for, for maximum impact. Uh, but um, within a few weeks of our project launch, it became apparent that, that, that COVID-19 was taking off worldwide. And, and so by March, we were in discussions with other research groups across the UK to think about how viral genome sequencing could help to fight the pandemic. And, and that led to the formation of COG UK, which is a consortium of 16 sequencing labs working closely with the NHS testing labs and the UK public health agencies. And within that, Sanger's role was to complement the regional sequencing labs and serve as a, as a national sequencing hub. And our scientific operations team here at Sanger stood up a sequencing pipeline, initially aiming to process a thousand viral samples a day, and that seemed like an extremely large number at the time. It, it was a project that had a lot of volunteers from across the, the Sanger, uh, over 200 staff volunteered. So it was a big project involving the whole institute. Um, by April 2020, an extraordinary opportunity came up for Sanger to collaborate with a new a uh, ne national network of COVID testing labs called the Lighthouse Labs. A and um, that offered the opportunity to establish a systematic framework for national genomic surveillance, because uh, these Lighthouse samples accounted for about 70% of confirmed cases across the UK with a broad geographical coverage. And, and, and most of the samples came from symptomatic individuals in the community as opposed to hospital admissions. So this gave uh, an opportunity for systematic uh, sampling across the whole country. But there were a, a bunch of very uh, daunting initial challenges. One was the logistics of shipping and, and handling uh, 300,000 samples per week. And those samples were just waste RNA from testing. They were both positives and negatives on the same plate. They had to be, the positives had to be cherry picked out of the plate. That was difficult. In many senses, it needed robotics that we didn't have at the time. There was a lot of manual operation, but it was made worse by the fact that the shipments were arriving with very patchy sample metadata. Uh, so it was very slow to work out which samples to pick. And there was no easy way, way to get key epi metadata, such as sample time location. Uh, and this is where a very proud of the malaria gene team came in, in particular, John Silito, Sonia Gonzalez, Christina Ariani, and Robert Marto. Uh, and with other members of Sanger, but took a lead in trying to put together a framework to deal with this avalanche of samples coming from the national testing network. And, and over the past year, we put together processes for handling on the order of half a million samples a week. And that in, 
involves sample shipments from labs across the UK, Scotland, uh, and England, and Northern Ireland, daily shipments of waste RNA samples left, left over from testing. And as well as those sample shipments, there's operational data flow of box manifests and plate maps and sample metadata flows coming from NHS Digital and Public Health in England. And they're all integrated into a, a set of processes, pipelines and delivery teams that are working on sample receipt, sample cherry picking, library preparation, sequencing and QC, and then uploading those data to the, uh, the CLIM cloud data infrastructure, which is the data uh, repository of the COG UK network, but also reporting directly to the Department of Health and Public Health England on variants of concern. Uh, and uh, over that time, we've, we've been continually improving our processes. One of the challenges at the outset was that our time to um, our flash to bang time from uh, a sample being tested to uploading data was over three weeks. But over the course of the year, we've narrowed that down to a week and our target is, is, is less than five days. That, that, that flash to bang is the total time from test to providing sequence data and variant calls to the public health agencies. It includes all the shipment of samples from around the UK, the cherry picking process of positive samples, the QC process and the integration of different data streams. So it's the end to end process. Uh, we've sequenced uh, over 300,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes here at Sanger, which is about 20% of the global total. Um, and uh, the key thing is that that now provides a framework for us to look across the UK and see what's happening in near real time. Uh, and we've, if you go to this website, COV-19 Sanger at UK, you can see some visual analytics put together by Jeff Barrett's team in collaboration with, with Moritz Gerstner at EBI and, and Theo Sarmerson at Crick that gives a, a, a near real-time representation of things happening here. So what we can see here is the spread of the so-called alpha variant, or what was known formally as the Kent or B117 variant across the UK, it's starting to expand in the, in the later part of last year uh, and really sort of taking off in the early months of this year and now starting to decline because of national lockdown and starting to be overtaken by a new variant, the Delta variant, which is spreading around the world. And this ability to see the spatial temporal spread of, of a virus and how different lineages are evolving within that spatial temporal spread gives us a huge amount of power to, to steer um, all sorts of interventions, to think about uh, lockdown, to think about how well vaccines are working. Um, it, it's, a, it's a game changer to have that type of spatial temporal representation. Now, what we've learned over the last year is uh, that genomic epidemiology is a co-evolutionary process, that the viral genome is evolving, it's acquiring variation and it's evolving, but so are the public health use cases of, for viral epidemiology. So in, in the early phases of the epidemic, a lot of focus was on analyzing where outbreaks came from uh, and where super spreading events were happening. But of course now there's a much more attention on managing variants of concern. As, as we've evolved a, a better surveillance capability, that's shaping our pu public health actions, along, of course, with other things like, importantly, vaccines. And as those public health actions change, our lockdown policy, our vaccines, and other interventions, that in turn is affecting how the virus is evolving. So all of these things are working together in, in a dynamic way. Um, the, the story of COVID evolution so far is interesting. It started out as a virus, which appeared to have a relatively low mutation rate, and there wasn't much variation in the population. And, and many people felt that genomic epidemiology was rather boring. But progressively, um, through the vast numbers of the virus, the vast population size of the virus, a lot of variation has accumulated in the population, mostly neutral. But early on, we started to see some evolutionary selection of variants with increased transmissibility, the, the D614G spike mutation in particular. But then, as we know, at the end of last year, the alpha variant appeared to start off in Kent and spread through the UK and the rest of the world. And more recently, the Delta variant, which seems to be significantly more transmissible than the alpha variant. And of course, the worrying thing next is, is will there be evolutionary selection of vaccine escape mutants? That's the thing that we're going to be watching out for in year, over the rest of this year and for many years to come. 
So what are the key messages from all this? Well, one is that sequencing is just part of genomic surveillance. It's all very well to be able to sequence a sample in 24 hours, but what matters is what's the time between that case emerging in the community to that individual getting tested, to that test being processed, to that sample getting to the sequencer, and then most importantly, that sequencing information being integrated with other sources of epi data that makes it useful to public health agencies. And the front end and the back end of that process take a very long time, and they don't happen unless there's very close integration with public health agencies. And public health agencies are busy people, and they're only what to do that if the genomic surveillance is seen to be useful. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg there. The second thing is that open data is empowering. We know that, and it's been vital in the fight against um, COVID-19 in the sense that seeing where problems are rising around the world, being prepared for importation of samples that might be dangerous for, from, from different parts of the world. Uh, um, but not only is open data important, we're learning so is longitudinal surveillance data. Longitudinal surveillance is really boring until something happens and then it's vital. So for example, it's been vital in understanding which variants are more transmissible. And finally, use cases evolve, that uh, initially the use cases uh, may seem to be about uh, transmission networks, later on they may be more about um, understanding evolution of new variants, and, and, and that is a dynamic, uh, a, a dynamic process. So the important thing is not to be too, too dogmatic, but rather be, to be prepared for the uh, unexpected. Now, back to malaria, although COVID has been very disruptive in many ways. It's, it's raised awareness of the challenges of controlling infectious disease and how genomic epidemiology can help to overcome some of those challenges. Sustainable malaria control and elimination needs different countries to share genomic surveillance data on parasites and mosquitoes with the right governance structures and well curated data resources. It, it needs uh, surveillance data to be translated into actionable information tailored for specific use cases in control and elimination. It requires control programs to have access to the services and technical support they need to collect surveillance data and use it in their decision making. Um, many parts, of, many, many people in this conference are working on different parts of the puzzle. And in our panel session, it would be great if we, if we can discuss how, how we can all work together more effectively to crack this incredibly tough problem. I just want to say a, a few brief words about some things that are happening in the malaria network that contribute to that effort. One is, of course, releasing well curated open data resources. And at this meeting, uh, Alistair and Chris have talked about recent data releases for Anopheles genome variation and insecticide resistance. And Richard and Jacob have talked about some forthcoming data releases for the Plasmodium genome uh, and for drug resistance. And I encourage you to, to look at the Malaria website and see what, what we have now and what's coming up in, 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 in the next few months. Um, another really important thing, of course, is the, uh, the, the development of effective tools for amplicon sequencing that was vital in fighting uh, COVID-19. The Arctic protocol was, was fantastic for many groups around the world in getting started. I'm, very proud to say that our colleagues in Ghana, led by Gordon Owandari, uh, using, uh, using uh, the Arctic Protocol, but also then using systems that we'd helped to build for, for malaria amplicon sequencing, they were amongst the first groups in Africa to get out COVID-19 surveillance data. One of the things we've done in malaria is, is set up a, an amplicon toolkit user group, groups around the world in, in Ghana, in Gambia, Tanzania, Mali, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, who are are working, who are using the, the tool, the Amplicon toolkits we have developed at Malaria Gym. But of course, there are many other groups around the world who are building fantastic Amplicon sequencing tools. And it would be great to discuss in the panel session what, what's the best forum for all of these groups who are developing resources and who are using these resources to get together so we, we, we synergize to maximum effect. Now, when we hold uh, GEM conferences at Inkston, um, Typically, the home team uh, enjoys firstly greeting you all, but also uh, taking you out to the Red Lion and laying on some additional amusements. And I'm sorry we aren't able to do that this year, but we're really looking forward to, in the post-COVID world, of meeting up again, working with you all again, 
uh, and also importantly thinking about how we can set up a gem meeting in Africa. Um, and then um, finally, I want to just reflect on how our network, our Malaysian network was, was conceived. It was it started off uh, at a, a meeting in Accra in January 2004, uh, and uh, it brought together delegates from across Africa. And the key question was, how could we uh, set up a system for equitable data sharing of human genetic data? Because at that time, there was great interest, uh, particularly in how you could do large multi-center studies of human genetics for sensitivity to malaria. And together, we hammered out many of the principles that have underlay, that underlie uh, our current network. Um, I want to just pay tribute to two of our founders. Um, firstly, the great Ogabara Dumbo, who did so much to establish the, the current generation of malaria researchers in Africa and to promote the, the, the cause of genomic epidemiology. And it's very sad that Ogo died before he could see all the fruits of his efforts. I, I also want to pay a, a personal tribute to Kurt Rocket, who's, who's very well known to many of you as a mentor, a teacher, a total technical support package uh, for all things to do with malaria and genetics and, and, and indeed as a friend. Um, Kirk has just retired from the University of Oxford um, and I want to say to Kirk on behalf of all of us, happy retirement Kirk and thank you so much for all you've done. And then finally I just want to reflect on the fact that when we started off malaria gen uh, 17 years ago, um, it was not possible to genome sequence a, uh, a parasite out of a clinical sample. It wasn't possible to genome sequence a malaria mosquito. Uh, and there were many other things that we couldn't do back then. And, and I want to say that even though the challenges of the next 17 years are daunting, how we're actually going to put genomic surveillance into practice, uh, I would like to say a lot has happened in the last 17 years. A great deal will happen in the next 17 years. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to our future meetings face to face so we can work out how we're together we're going to make that happen and put genomic epidemiology into practice for malaria. Thank you. Thanks to our speakers. A big thank you to uh, uh, Sophonia, Jen and Dominic for the wonderful talks. And it's a pleasure to share the panel discussion session, which I've, I've been looking forward to. And it's now happening though virtually. Dominic, I can tell you, it's so exciting. Uh, and, and, and before we even go anywhere into whatever we wanted to discuss, talks. Dominic, could you briefly take us through the genesis and history of GEM from our first GEM meeting to today, where we are happy to have have about 300 people attending GEM. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned in my talk, our first meeting, I think the inaugural meeting was in January 2004, which was actually in Ghana, hosted by Kojo Koram. And uh, your colleague, Peter Dingwork, was there, and many other famous scientists from across Africa, including Okobara Dumbo and Jimde and others. And then our first uh, proper meeting uh, when Malaysia started was the inaugural meeting was in January, in June 2005. And since then, we've had uh, either an annual or a biannual meeting since then, and it's grown uh, to this amazing community and beyond, well beyond malaria. It's, it's been fantastic. And, and uh, as I mentioned in my talk in the early days, we didn't know how to sequence a parasite genome out of a clinical sample. We didn't know how to sequence a wild caught mosquito. So there's been a lot of technical development in that time. Now I have some questions, uh, provoke the discussion. And I'll straight go to Jenny, and, and, and she's a great speaker. I hope you, you all appreciate what she, how her, her speech was, which I liked so much, although I missed some parts because of internet. So thoughts of how we could structure genomic capacity building and whether the regional hub uh, format or going to uniform across all the countries. So how could that be done? And, and please give, give us your thoughts of, because we would want to know where do we go from here. Uh, over to you, Jen, and then we'll hear from uh, Sophonias and Dominic as well. 
Thanks, Deus. Uh, yeah, I think the, the hub and spoke model, <clears throat> excuse me, is a really effective one. Um, it, it, looking at how genomic epidemiology has rolled out in other uh, jurisdictions, you can't just go all in on everything everywhere at once. It, it's just not going to work. These networks kind of have to develop organically. And what we've seen, you know, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, and the sequencing capacity that's there, there have been some teams that have been working for many, many years in this area, like your own lab, for example, uh, who are really well positioned to take a lead now. And there are other groups, uh, you know, I imagine there's quite a few people on the call today who are just starting their malaria genomic epidemiology journey. So you can kind of imagine a tiered approach where folks that are a little further uh, kind of down the road, they've been working in this space a bit longer, they become those regional hub labs and they start to connect with the folks whose labs are just coming online. Those become the sort of spokes in the region. And you can think about this, you know, at very, very large scales, for example, what Africa CDC is doing with the um, pathogen genomics initiative, but you can think about it in smaller scales too. So if you look at, you know, in malaria genomic epidemiology, uh, two of the use cases that um, have essentially sort of WHO endorsement to, to go forward now are using molecular techniques to look at drug resistance and looking at uh, HRP23 deletions. So you can imagine for each of these use cases, a similar sort of network structure. So just thinking about drug resistance, for example, um, Imagine, let's say, you know, four tiers of laboratory. At the, the bottom most tier, you've got spoke, uh, spokes in a network or the, the uh, kind of smallest nodes in a network. They're the ones that are collecting samples. They might have qPCR capacity. They can do some of the work there. Um, then you've got these regional hubs um, that might have additional capacity, hold genome you know, sequencing capacity, for example. So samples that looked kind of interesting, maybe they were phenotypically resistant, but qPCR didn't point at any of the um, canonical molecular markers of resistance. Those samples might then go up to those kind of tier two labs for regional sequencing. Then you can think about um, groups uh, like uh, the FIDIC lab, the Menard lab, who are doing functional genomics. If you see a new mutation that's discovered and you want to validate it, uh, can those samples then go up to kind of a third tier of labs doing this enhanced functional genomics work. And then you can think of networks like MalariaGen and the Plasmodium Community Project where you've almost got, you know, with whole genome sequencing and looking for signals of positive selection, kind of like a long range radar for future drug resistance yeah. mutations. So this notion of having um, labs everywhere that have some basic molecular capacity that can feed up into ever more specialized regional labs is I think the way to go um, both at that Africa CDC scale cross pathogen, but also for specific use cases in malaria. Thank, thanks again. Uh, Sophonia, so to take from where Jen left, and, and I hope you agree with her that we can uh, go through the entire horizon with small labs, medium, big, uh, and the biggest. So, what is your plan for capacity building within the Africa CDC and the AU? Uh, a area. And um, do you think our regional hubs more viable for pathogen core facility? And what kind of support or fund funding will be required to ensure we have that capacity in place? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Deus. Uh, thanks, Jen. I think Jen already described it from a structural perspective and uh, operational perspective. But I would also like to add uh, access to this. Uh, basically, if you look at the continent, 28 out of 55 countries, they do not have any NGS capacity at the moment right now. Um, and how do we provide access to genomics, access to sequencing to these countries? Because the pathogens are not waiting uh, for us. So we have to have a mechanism where we create access to countries that do not have sequencing capacity or that have very limited sequencing capacity. So I think the, the hub and spoke model uh, is, uh, is, is very important in terms of providing access. Um, but in the other direction, we are also trying to expand small scale capacity in member states. That's also very important as, as it's indicated in the question. Um, we're not just only for regional hubs. We also need, need to, to do more work in terms of expanding access 
to sequencing capacities, sequencing equipment, sequencing um, technologies, as well as you know, expertise. So this is how the Africa PGI is modeled. It's not just only to the regional hubs, but at the same time trying to decentralize and expand uh, capacities uh, to other countries. So by that, what that means is, um, I can give a simple example. Two, three weeks ago, we provided a small package of ONT equipment and reagent to Zimbabwe. Uh, before that, Zimbabwe has been sending samples to the regional hub. So two, three weeks later, they are able to establish their own capacity and they start sequencing SARS-CoV-2 locally. And they reported one of the variants uh, very recently using local capacity. So that way we are trying to also decentralize capacity uh, at the same time reducing the burden uh, on uh, the regional hubs because our regional hubs are supporting more than three to 10 countries per hub are currently being supported. So I, I think uh, the hub and spoke model uh, as a transition until we have all countries uh, uh, performing NGS uh, or uh, sequencing capacity we need to have some transitional capacity where they can have access to sequencing. And one thing that Jen, men Jen mentioned, we also need to think about um, how do we think genotypic data with phenotypic data? We need to have some laboratories, specialized or regional laboratories that have the capacity to do that. So uh, that capacity cannot easily be just uh, distributed across all of uh, the countries. So I think that the hard and spoke model can really help us in terms of linking uh, genetic data with phenotypic data and understanding, you know, what these mutations cause and all those all those kind of biological questions. So uh, we are operating on both ways, trying to strengthen regional labs at the same time, trying to decentralize uh, sequencing capacity when it makes sense. Over to you, Deus. Great, Sophonias, and I'm um, pleased to have been part of the initiative before COVID struck, and and I hope will continue from where we left with such, such an enthusiasm. So now I, I go to Dominic. Dominic, you have been in this space for so long, over 20 years now, and probably even more, but I know when we started and, and how it was hard, even talk about genomic epidemiology concepts, and now we are able to at least communicate even with the NMCPs. So Dominic, your views on how we could build the capacity, but I, I would even, I mean, furthermore, wish to hear your thoughts of data sharing issues. If, if different com pathogen communities have different data sharing customs and uh, plans, guidelines, or whatever. So are, are, we, are we going to work uh, with that kind of system, particularly if we were to set up a multi-pathogen core facility? or core facilities in different countries? Yeah, that's a very tough question, Des. Uh, I have to say, when we started out, we had what was at the time almost a, a tougher question because when we started out, it was about sharing of human genomic data. And there was a lot of concern about exploitation, about stigmatization and about intellectual property. And actually to the point that Jen made in her talk, actually, one of the first papers we wrote was about intellectual property because the concern was that, you know, um, people would use this information uh, and, and rip off uh, what was essentially lo local, local intellectual property. There was also uh, a concern raised by one of your senior colleagues in Tanzania that this information might be used for bioterrorism, actually, and that what was known about local uh, patterns of human genetics, but also local pathogens, would be used as a we would be weaponized. So it was a very fraught debate. Uh, and uh, I mean, as you know, Deus, within Malarigen, the process we just used was to try out ideas, to discuss them, but then importantly, to put out consultation documents that tried to gather opinions, and then through some process of workshops, and often lots of different regional workshops, local workshops and more general ones, tried to get some sort of, to, to look for consensus and to, to listen to what people thought were thinking. And out of that, tried to get some sort of consensus that one could ro roll out as a policy document. And we've made some inroads in that sort of area. What we have found though, Deus, as you well know, is that different communities respond differently to that. So the, the, the attitude of that, amongst the human genetic community has turned out to be quite different from the parasite genetic community, which has turned out to be quite different from, from the uh, mosquito genetic community. And I will say at the risk of offending anyone that the mosquito genetic community is the coolest of all because they really want to share data. 
they love sharing data and somehow that is imbued in their mission. But, you know, I think that comes back to Jen's point in that community, mosquitoes aren't seen to be something that people really want to own that much. They just want to share information about it. Whereas I think there's a lot more concern about human genetics and also pathogen and parasite genetics is more difficult. But really, I don't think one can, one can shortcut this. There has to be processes of just listening to what people think at every level. And then there has to be some sort of consultative process. But that obviously is very difficult to work out at a global scale. And I think our advantage in malaria region so far is for quite a small community. That's been a feasible exercise. How you break it down across a continent, I don't know. Sorry, that was a bit of a long answer to your question, Dennis, but... <laughs> no, 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 Dominic, thank you so much. But Dominic, I, I still wanted to hear more from you. I, I do remember in some of the meetings and at that time I was too junior even to ask a question and how people were even getting hard on you and how frustrating it was even getting to getting samples, getting data and get even people to respond accordingly. And, and I can't imagine how you were responding to funders in terms of reporting. So. If you had one, maybe one or two sentences to, 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 to share with us so that we don't have to go through the hardship you went through, what would you tell us in terms of building the communities, particularly around the data sharing and material sharing? Well, so your, your question, Des, is, is what's the, uh, just to be clear, so I can answer your question properly, just to, to, the, the question is, how can we build capacity around data sharing? Is that, is that? Yes, like the takes from your experience of over 20 years, uh, bouncing on people in different media, different forms, and how frustrating it has been on your side. So what one or two things we could learn from you and take with us moving forward so that we don't have to take the path you took? Well, I think, I think the one thing, it's all been very difficult, but there is really one thing that does cut through a lot, which is having a clear mm -hmm. use case. When people can see clarity okay. that you're trying to do something that relates to a problem they're trying to solve, they immediately engage. I think the worry is when we talk in abstract terms, and people can see we're gathering information and they don't quite know how we're going to use it. So I think we have to start off with, you know, a great place to start is giving one good example of something we can do that will help a government, will help an NMCP. And that gets engagement and that allows the conversation to begin. So I think we do have to look for, for initial use cases. And I think that's where COVID has been so helpful for us. For us. And I can just one thing I didn't say in my talk, I'll tell you a little secret to this public audience, but we uh, actually, in the first six months of our COVID sequencing, we did find it quite difficult to engage with many of our contacts in government because they couldn't quite see why it was that useful. All of that changed in about one week in December 2020, when suddenly they got the point they needed to know this information to make national decisions about lockdown. Suddenly we started to engage and then all sorts of other conversations started to actually become easier because they wanted to have the conversation. And I think in our challenge for malaria is really making that link between the things we're doing and something that is useful to an NMCP or a vector control program. And I think we have some great stories, but we have to really focus on those. Thank you, Dominic. I, I, I think in my case would be trying to speak the language of, of whoever wants to, to use our data. And I think that that's a very important lesson and, and takes us further to that space of government, mini, governments and ministries of health. And I'll, I'll have to go back to Sophonius because in his capacity at the African Union and Africa CDC, that's where he keeps it. I mean, that's what consumes his time. And Sophonius, what do you think? Are governments and ministries of health ready and interested to use genomic and EPI data for decision making? And if not, how can we as a community build the engagement, that engagement? And what could we have from COVID-19? Dominic already alluded on that, but we would be curious to hear from you, particularly as you have spent almost two years, and I remember the frustrating time we couldn't even get in touch over sensitive issues, but just talk to us. 
Sophonius, tell us what you have been going through and how hard or easy it has been uh, working with a, a governments and ministries of health. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, uh, Deus. I think uh, 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 Professor Dominic has already said it. I think COVID actually paved uh, the way. Uh, COVID opened uh, the door of lots of Ministry of Health uh, in the continent. Uh, today, while we're speaking, I think genomics, genomic surveillance, sequencing is, is, is something that's being discussed every day at uh, the Ministry of Health uh, level. So I think uh, that has changed a lot in terms of um, interest, uh, in terms of understanding of genomics, in terms of its utility in informing um, decision, uh, uh, decision making, uh, as well as in terms of you know, the need to have that capacity uh, to, to have that capacity locally, as well as to use you know, regional uh, capacities. I think uh, to just link this from what we are doing, um, uh, if you asked me last year and uh, uh, about sample referral in Africa, sending samples to regional hubs, um, I would say you know, that probably is the most difficult thing to do. Uh, today, the challenge is changing now. The challenge is now in the regional hubs. We have 30 countries that have sent samples to eight regional hubs within uh, the last five months. Uh, so the demand, the interest is increasing, but how do we continue this interest? How do we sustainably use this uh, to, um, uh, to continue the interest, to continue the support, to continue the engagement for other pathogens is I think, I think the question. And I fully agree with uh, what Professor Dominic said, clear use cases are needed. We need to link it because COVID-19 was a very clear use case. Uh, a country that do not know about their variant, they know about their variant after sequencing 20, 30 samples. So it, it's very clear and it addresses the questions of uh, the Ministry of Health, it addresses the questions of the National Public Health Institute. So I think, how do we continue from here? How do we, how do we use this opportunity uh, to leverage in terms of engagement, easing all the political challenges of data sharing? You know, that's a big issue. Uh, now, you know, countries are open to share samples. So how do we leverage from that and go and back and say, you know, we need to share data. The more we share it, uh, 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 the better. We have to demonstrate that uh, to the countries. I think uh, COVID has played a huge role and it actually is a lot of our challenge when it comes to engagement, interest, uh, and countries' interest to implement. Uh, some countries are buying machines, we know. Some countries are asking us, you know, we buy the machine, how do you support us with the bioinformatics? These are the kind of questions that we get now compared to, you know, the question that we were getting last year. Uh, uh, just a comparison, uh, by March 2020, when the COVID-19 um, outbreak was expanding in Africa, I contacted 10 countries to send samples to regional hubs. None of them replied. But in December, I was getting 20, 30 emails a day about like, you know, where to send the sample. So this is how much uh, uh, things are changing. So I think this is a good opportunity for the community, but how do we translate this into other pathogen? How do we make it sustainable uh, is, is the big question that we are having now. Thank you, Sophonia. So exciting. That's why we wanted to hear from you. I remember Sophonia, how hard it was to get in touch with you. You became one of the most scarce persons I ever seen in, in 2020. So Jenny, I, I still wish to hear from you. We have one of the flagship projects you are proud of in Senegal, where NMCP and the malaria researchers are really working in an excellent framework. And I wish most of us could just borrowed. If, you, if it were like a cup of tea, we could just ship it and, and bring it to another country and let them drink from it and enjoy the coffee, uh, which the Senegalese team are enjoying. So in, in your dreams, how do you see it, the malaria community working together, the same way the Senegalese team is doing? I mean, how, how would that take With, within your aspirations? How, how, how how soon would you wish to see that happen? Or, or think it will happen in many other countries in Africa? If anything has to be done, what is that? 
Excellent question. Um, it will happen and it will happen soon. And I think so much of, um, you know, what you see in Senegal, for example, is the result of relationships, relationships that have been built over time and sustained over time. We see the exact same thing in the malaria gen network. And this is really decades worth of people working together. Um, in both of those examples, it really is a, a true community. And so I think, um, having more and more events, more and more venues through which people can create those relationships and sustain those relationships. We're working actually right now with Professor Jim Day and the Pathogens Genomic Diversity Network Africa, which of course is spun out of malaria gen, uh, exactly on that sort of community building piece. Because it's not enough, you know, just to drop a sequencer in a, in a lab and expect magic to happen. You need an ecosystem, you need a community, you need the glue that kind of holds that together. Um, so I know Jim Day has been in touch with many of the folks that are probably uh, in the audience today, and I know he's curious to solicit folks' input on what would, for Sub-Saharan Africa, an ideal malaria molecular surveillance community look like. So if anybody's got thoughts, ideas, feedback, suggestions, by all means, drop them into the Q&A. I know Professor Jim Day is listening, and we're certainly listening too. But the more that we can do to cultivate those relationships, the better. And, you know, while it would be nice to be gathering in person with Jim, um, I think the pandemic has really shown us that we can connect virtually in very meaningful ways, whether that's through um, regular webinars, uh, virtual events, you know, the Senegalese teams, uh, weekly lab meeting is all virtual and uh, folks like yourself, Deus, regularly join the call. So I think um, the pandemic has really shown us new and more inclusive ways of working that we can kind of fold into this future state. So just a lot of community building, relationship building, communication, regular sharing of you know, protocols, results, um, you know, even something as simple as a WhatsApp group or a Slack group for people just to connect and, and share thoughts. All of these things are starting to happen and can be strengthened and I think will mean, you know, next time Gem rolls around and hopefully we can do a Gem in Africa too, um, we can have a really, really strong community. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. I'm moving to the space, which I hope, which I'm sure it's dear to you and you have been in this space of innovation, capacity building, convergence, and, 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 and so you'll be the best person to tell us. Um, so many exciting new tools are, have been developed over the past year. Where are the gaps and are there any issues with having too many tools? And how important is it for the field to converge on approaches within and among diseases to build the capacity? So Dominic, please. So where, 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 would, be, where would I like to see the best innovation? Um, I, I think the innovation that I'm most interested in is the innovation that allows us to integrate what we do and to share what we do. So, you know, for example, in the in the space of Amplicon sequencing, there's a, there's a or, or indeed other technologies to get at targeted gene regions of resistance. There are actually some wonderful different ways of doing that, um, and each of them have their own benefits, it's, many have their own limitations. The question is, in that very diverse space, how do we arrange it so that despite all the differences, we can get commonalities out of it? For example, if we were all calling uh, a drug resistance using different technologies, how would we align our results and we could benchmark them and improve them? And, and one of the most, uh, the things that's come across to me most strongly from the COVID um, pandemic and our experiences dealing with it is this thing of continual improvement, the ability to take something you want to measure and just keep getting better at it. So, for example, at Sanger, when we started to do our COVID sequencing, we were sort of good at some things, but actually we took a very long time over many things. But we've managed to very much reduce turnaround times and increase quality just by a process of continual improvement. And that does require different labs to be able to benchmark things, to compare things. Uh, and, and I do think that as a, as a community, as we develop wonderful ways of getting at different things like resistant markers in parasites and mosquitoes, that ability to benchmark is very important. Um, but then if you want a more technical answer, I think that, for example, 
as we've heard at this meeting in the case of parasites, being able to phase parasites, that's to say being able to sort of deconvolute infections is really important. And I think there, there'll be extraordinary technical advances both in terms of long read sequencing, but also in terms of algorithms that, that can deconvolute. I think long read sequencing will be fantastic when it comes to looking at mosquito genomes as well. So I think there's some fantastic things coming down the pipe from a purely te te technological angle. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, yes, Sophonius, we just have had exciting stuff from you and the panels about COVID-19 and, and the lessons we have learned. Can you tell us more what COVID-19 has taught us about the resolution of data and sampling needed to inform decisions for public health? And do these lessons apply to malaria and other diseases? Yeah, uh, thanks, Dears. That's a very, very good question. And that's a question that we ask every day uh, to, um, to experts uh, in this field. Uh, how much data is enough uh, to, uh, to answer a specific question and to inform a policy decision? And how do we make sure that, you know, that sufficient data is generated? I think that's, that's the question of all of us here at the Africa CDC. Um, uh, but we don't have, you know, there's no simple, straightforward answer because the sampling framework uh, for different questions is different. Uh, uh, but the approach, the operationally feasible uh, approach that was recommended to us, let's start with simple and let's try to make it more routine. Uh, that way it gives us the opportunity to learn from the data and improve how we sample the next time and improve how we use that for uh, informing uh, public health decision making. Because we are struggling at the moment, for example, to answer how much data is and what kind of sampling strategy is or framework is needed to evaluate, um, uh, to monitor vac vaccine escape variants, for example, in the continent, especially in those countries that have higher vaccine coverage and less uh, number of cases. So it, it, it's, it's, it's very, uh, difficult question. We don't have a simple answer, uh, but what we are trying to achieve is what can we do operationally? Simple, but routine. I think that is uh, what we are focusing on so that that data can be somehow aggregated or the trend can somehow uh, provide some information to uh, public health decision makers. But I think this is a question that we are, we are um, uh, uh, consulting with all uh, lots of experts. So anyone who has big, good ideas, please share it with us in terms of uh, sampling strategies. I think this is what we learn, what we need to learn uh, uh, for the malaria community as well. How much data is enough? Well, how do we need to sample it? And where do we need to sample it? How do, how do we make it representative enough? You know, those are the kind of questions that, that, that are really uh, being raised uh, from uh, the COVID community or the COVID outbreak. But I think that can be translated into other pathogens as well. Thanks, Sophonias. I have, we have a specific question for you from uh, Christian in Sanzabana, and um, he, he says it's a great talk and very nice initiative from Africa CDC. Could you elaborate more about the PPP, the private public partnership aspect, and what could be the contribution of Africa, African public and private sectors? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. So the formation of this initiative, I think it brings, you know, the private, the public sector um, uh, uh, together. Uh, and the African Union is also one of the supporters of this initiative, which is, uh, uh, which is very important for, uh, uh, to think about sustainability. How do we bring it to, uh, to the hands of, you know, the Ministry of Health, to the hands of uh, the countries? Uh, but uh, the way how we see this initiative is, this is catalytic initiative. We're trying to uh, catalyze uh, the uh, building of capacity, uh, expansion of um, genomics access, and then also you know, addressing some key, uh, very important, big challenges. Having the private sector into this is actually uh, uh, changing a lot because if you look at, I think uh, lots of malaria researchers also face this. One of the biggest challenge that we have is access to reagents, getting it on a timely fashion, getting technical support, installing machines, maintaining them, and all those kind of questions. 
So uh, engaging the private sector into this kind of initiative, it's, it's very important to actually uh, 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 to actually uh, take the African market very seriously, even if it's not that profitable at the moment. So uh, that's exactly what they are doing. They are expanding their um, offices. They are expanding their uh, technical support. They are creating dedicated uh, teams to support uh, uh, African countries. So I think uh, the, the private sector is very important. When it comes to African private sector, we are trying to engage with uh, few, there are very few uh, uh, private sectors in the continent in this field, in the, in the bioinformatics and in the genomics field. So we're trying to engage with uh, private, the private sector in the continent to see how we can engage them in terms of uh, being part of this, uh, this uh, uh, member states in terms of expanding uh, genomics capacity. I can give a, a couple of examples. There are African private sectors currently supporting few countries in terms of bioinformatics data analysis processes. These are, uh, you know, African uh, private sector. So we are in the process of engagement. More engagement is needed. More partners are needed. Uh, uh, we need more the private sector into this so that, you know, some of the solutions are in the private sector, in the private sector, and then we can bring that solution and use it to uh, improve uh, the, the, some of the challenges, address some of the challenges that, that we, are see, we are facing now uh, in the implementation of this initiative. Thank you so much, Sophonias, and I will take those, your, your last uh, comments. If I get a minute, I'll come back to you. Uh, Jenny, I'll give you just two minutes uh, to answer a question on whether the regional hubs will sort out the issues of reagents and all the intricates and what the, the Gates Foundation is doing uh, to help countries and sort out this bottleneck. And then use one more minute to wind up and give your uh, views and reflections of how we move forward in this space. So Jen, two minutes to you, and then I'll have two minutes for Dominique. You got it. I'll keep an eye on the clock here. Um, so I think um, using a hub model is a really effective way of overcoming procurement challenges. When you can do bulk procurement, you achieve savings um, that you can't get when you're doing individual purchasing alone. And so I think there's a real role for African Union and uh, some of the, like there's an African continental free trade agreement, for example, um, and it, it doesn't quite have legs yet, um, but there's a real role for continent-wide structures like that to um, both procure commodities and ease the movement of commodities across borders, ensuring that there's unified policies, for example, around duty-free status for equipment and reagents. So with, um, you know, in numbers comes power. So, so that's one of the things that I think will work, this, this bulk regional approach. In terms of what the Gates Found uh, Foundation is doing specifically, a lot of it right now is just leaning on people. Um, we've really worked closely with groups like Illumina and Oxford Nanopore to raise awareness of the problem of, um, for example, having to work through third party resellers. We had a huge success um, late last year when Illumina agreed to serve the African markets directly rather than through a reseller, um, which resulted immediately in cost savings to a lot of our partners. So continuing to kind of lean on groups and also explore what role um, entities within the global health architecture uh, can play in this space. For example, Global Fund, um, we know is a master at procurement, but that procurement is generally limited to HIV, TB, and malaria commodities, you know, bed nets, medicines, RDTs, et cetera. Um, what if laboratory reagents were added to this list and procurement of those um, was uh, done through the same channels and the same supply channels were used, or supply chain channels were used to get that equipment out into country. So looking at at, um, working with industry as well as working with those big global entities to uh, ensure a more uh, cohesive approach to getting equipment and consumables into countries. We don't, we'd love to see the end of, you know, last time I saw you in Sanger, you were muling back a whole duffel bag full of uh, reagents and equipment. We'd love to see that end so that you can just keep your luggage for bringing souvenirs back and uh, yeah, not a bunch of lab equipment. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. Dominic, unfortunately, we have just one minute. And um, Rob, um, uh, Roberta Mato wants to hear about innovation and whether that things can be read in one, 
two, three, five, ten, ten years to many different people. But again, if you could use 30 seconds on that and, and, and give your final reflections. So Fonias, I'm sorry, I want to get back to you, but thank you so much for the insights. Dominic, over to you. Innovation, uh, what we can do in one year. Um, one, 10 years. One or 10 years. Um, well, I think in, in one year, we should aim to have, the, the big innovation I think actually is to have a coherent use case of our malaria community that everyone aligns up to, and it doesn't really matter what tools we use, it doesn't matter what Ampicon toolkit we use or other genotyping method, but we get a message across to NMCPs uh, across the tropics, but particularly in Africa, that this is a, something they can use to track, to, to make decisions about, for example, either drug or insecticide usage. That's, that's the key usage. I think that 10 years time, I believe that this will, I believe this field will be the leading field in the whole of population genomics. We'll have more information about parasites and mosquitoes than there are about any other organism that's rapidly evolving in the eukaryotic space. And I think we'll be able to do amazing things about tracking transmission networks and understanding to the Duarte's point, really monitoring gene drive, watching how that's been rolling out across the community. I think it'll be the most ex exciting space in population genomics. So. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dominic, Jen, Sophonias. It has been a great pleasure chatting with you and sharing all this exciting stuff. And this brings us to the end of our panel discussion. And, and I hope everyone has enjoyed the discussion the same way I did. And hope to see you uh, next time. And hopefully we can, we can have some more new things to talk about.